Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer at this time, thanking you for the things that you give uh, to us for us to survive on this earth and this beautiful day uh, for us to enjoy. We pray, our Lord, that our service will be uh, acceptable to you and we will be able to learn more about your word uh, uh, through Bob Chambers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Should we make that bigger or do you guys see what we're Would you please stand up for the song? Got to stand up for this one. I stand to praise you, but I fall on my knees. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is too.
salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. All right, to go, can brother Bob. Hear me? Can everybody hear me okay? So I hope you can hear me. I want to talk tonight about a, a, a subject that I struggle with greatly. There's many, uh, how can I put this? There's many commands that Jesus gives us. Some of them are relatively easy for me to follow. The command to not be drunken. I have no problem with that. That's that's very easy for me. I've never really had a taste for alcohol or, or anything, anything like that. I've never been uh, lured by uh, uh, illegal drugs or anything else or, or even to abuse over-the-counter drugs. Those, those are easy things to follow for me. But there's a few commands that God gives us that are not so easy. We get into such commands as love your neighbor as yourself. Now that one's a little bit more of a challenge, but it's still not that difficult. After all, I live right next door to my neighbor, don't I? I can, I can treat him just as well as I would like to be treated, and it's easy. But then there's still one that hangs out there that just is very difficult for me. Growing up under the, uh, in, in the, during the Cold War in the 50s and the 60s, and uh, especially being in Omaha, Nebraska, I mean, we're, we're home of uh, Offutt Air Force Base, SAC headquarters. It was very easy to tell who, my, who the enemy was and that we were not only to fear him, but we were to hate him but God in his in his wisdom in such passages as in Matthew uh, 43 for uh, Matthew chapter 5 43 and 44 he says you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy but I say to you love your enemies bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And he's serious. We are to love our enemies. He, he tells us here in Matthew 5 and he, he tells us again in, in Luke 6, 27 and 28, he tells us the same thing. Love your enemies. And even the more I think about it, when you begin to take this to heart and you begin to apply it properly, loving your enemies can bless and transform not only your own life, it can truly make this world a better place. 
So let's let's examine this a little closer. Let's examine Jesus's command to love your enemies, uh, and 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 see what what is he actually asking us to do. First of all, who is our enemy? We've already read in Matthew five forty four. It's anyone who curses you. So I know some are now going to say, Brother Bob, do I do I really have to, you know? have good feelings for those who curse me? Do I really have to go out of my way to help them? They, they don't like me. If they don't like me, how can, how can I do anything for them? It's anyone who hates you. Those who, for whatever reason, would despise you, whether it be racial, political, religious, or maybe even personal reasons. Maybe, maybe you're just a better athlete than the next person, and they despise you for it. It's anyone who would spitefully use you, those who abuse, those who treat uh, spitefully, those who would falsely accuse you. That's what an enemy is. It's not just the, you know, the, the, the Russians, like, like when I was growing up, it was always, you know, the communists and the Russians, and we had to always be on our guard. And I mean, we even ran air raid drills in the hallways, you know, nuclear drills. It's also anyone who would persecute you. Those who persecute and pursue with repeated attacks of enmity. We can see such things happening to uh, Saul of Tarsus, uh, what he did to Christians in Acts chapter 8, verse 3. It says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragged and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now, let's be honest. What were what were first century prisons like? I know I like to to point that out uh, in in a lot of lessons, but you know what? They were no picnic. I know. I know. Even today, we we say you know they're they're heated in the winter, they're cooled in the summer, they have three meals a day, they have. Uh, running water and they have uh other other facilities available for the for the inmates but you know what even with all that i don't ever want to see the inside of a prison not as an inmate never and yet when we go back to the first century they were lucky to see maybe a moldy loaf of bread once in a great while they were lucky if they had any type of drainage to remove any any waste from the cell. It was never heated. It was never cooled. Whatever whatever temperature the the countryside was, that's what you got. It was not a good place to be. Not only did he do that, if we look in chapter nine, verses one and two, still talking about Saul of Tarsus. It says, then Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, uh, that he might uh, bring them bound to Jerusalem. So see, Paul's not even willing to just stay within the bounds of Judah, to stay within the bounds of Israel. He, he continues on. He wants to take his persecution of the church, and he wants to take it as far as he can. When we get to chapter 22, verse 4, it says, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prisons both men and women. In 26, verses 9 through 11, still in the book of Acts, chapter 26, 9 through 11, it says, Indeed, I myself 
thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul was relentless. Paul was truly at that point an enemy of the church. The thing I want to point out is our enemies can be family members, they can be neighbors, co-workers, fellow citizens, government representatives, both local and foreign. In other words, just about anyone who does not like us. So the pool of possible enemies out there is great, and we are to love our enemies. So let me ask now, let me ask a, a very important question. Okay, we know who our enemies are. We know Jesus has said we're supposed to love our enemy. But why? Why is he saying love your enemy? First and foremost, we are to love our enemy to be like God. Turn back again to Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew 5, verse 45, it says that you may be the sons of your father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. And if we look down in verse 48, it says, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. So we love our enemies to be like God, to be the sons of our father in heaven. We, we love our enemies because God is kind uh, to evil and unthankful men. In Luke 6, 35 and 36, it says, but love your enemies, do good and, and, uh, and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the, you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. We do what God wants. We love our enemies to be like him. We love our enemies to be unlike the sinner. Back in Matthew 5 again, in 46 and 47, it says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. You see, if we want to love those who are exactly like us, who think exactly like us, who do exactly like us, what good does that do? That's easy. That's simple. If I meet somebody on the street and he, he looks like me, he talks like me, he acts like me, well, we're probably going to be good friends. But what if I meet, a, meet somebody on the street who doesn't necessarily look like me? Maybe they talk with an accent. Maybe, maybe they have a difficult time even understanding English. Maybe they think things are completely opposite of what I think. Do I still need to love him? Yes. I do. We need to be unlike the sinners. To be unlike sinners, which is human, uh, being a, a sinner is human nature, but we are to be partakers of the divine. 
In 2 Peter 1, verse 4, it says, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We are human in every means, but we've been given a way to partake in the divine nature. We've been given a way, we've been shown the way of how to do so and how to do so more effectively. We love our enemies to overcome evil. Turn with me now to Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 12, I want to read verses 20 and 21. It says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, so, uh, for in, for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the whole point, and that's what Jesus is wanting us to get to. It's evil to, or it's easy to pay to repay evil with evil. If somebody hits you, if somebody spits on you, hit them back. Spit back. That's the easy way to do things. But when somebody spitefully uses you and you still Bless them. Treat them with kindness. That's difficult to do, but it makes a world of difference. Some well-known people who have, who have made uh, uh, some quotes that I would like to, to look at, uh, believe it or not, uh, I think you're going to be interesting uh, to hear some of these. The first quote is, I will never let another man ruin my life by making me hate him. That's from George Washington Carver. And the second quote that I have here is, those who hate you, oops, just about lost my place there. Those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself, Richard Nixon. So we do not let, we, 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 we love our enemy to overcome evil, not letting evil overcome us, but we do need to let, or we do need to overcome evil by doing good. Abraham Lincoln is known as saying, I am not destroying my enemies when I make friends of them. And Martin Luther King Jr. says, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. So, so far, we've heard Jesus wanting us to love our enemies. We've seen who our enemies are. We've seen why we are to love them. But now we get to the, probably the crux of the matter, the, the biggest obstacle we have, and that is how do we love our enemies? We love our enemies by blessing them, as commanded by Jesus, as, as repeated by Paul and by Peter. Uh, we've already read several verses uh, to that point, but I do want to look at 1 Peter 3, verse 9. It says, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to do this, that you may inherit a blessing. So we begin to love our enemy by blessing them, by doing good to them, as taught in both covenants. If we look in the, in the Old Testament back in Exodus 23, uh, in Exodus 23, 4 and 5, it says, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, 
you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. So even in the Old Testament, we are to do good for our enemies. Uh, if we if we go and look in the in the New Testament in Galatians six, verse ten, it says, "Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to those that we like." No, that's not what it says at all. It says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. You see, doing good to them has the potential, it has the ability to transform our enemies. In Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22, We can read, if your enemy is hungry, bring, bring him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap uh, coals of fire on his head and the Lord will reward you. We can, we can continue to love them by praying for them as Jesus taught. We see this both in, in, in Matthew 5, 44 and also in Luke 6, 28. We also see this exemplified by Jesus and his disciples. Uh, we see this in such passages as in Luke 23, 34, which tells us, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. We do this not just with love in our hearts, hoping that things go good for the others. We do so with active good will, which is the meaning of the word love, agape. Beautifully defined by Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, it says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own, is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Can you imagine treating your enemy like this? It all comes down as I, as I look and as I think about this, the more and more I think. We are not commanded to love our enemies with affection in our hearts. The kind of love that we, we have and we experience in families, you know, store game, or expressed among friends, phileo, or between brethren, Philadelphia. We are commanded to love our enemies with acts of will, displaying active goodwill toward them, true agape love, blessing them, doing good to them, praying for them. That's what it's all about. It's a difficult saying to love your enemies it's even more difficult to put it into practical use. But God, as we follow his will, God gives us the means, he gives us the way. 
However, where agape love is consistently shown, it is not unusual for phileo love to gradually develop. Even if not, we still have the duty and the privilege to be sons of the Most High. As I bring this lesson toward an end, I want to think of the following uh, passage. Turn with me to Titus chapter 3. <clears throat> There's a lot of people in this world, even in our own country, that treat each other with disrespect, rudeness, harshness. We have gun violence that is out of control. And it's just insane sometimes the things we hear on the news. But if we show love to our enemies, not only because of everything that's already been said, but if we show love to our enemies, because as it, as it is written in Titus 3, beginning in verse 3, it says, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, who he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You know, as Christians, we have a special bond. And we have a special relationship with our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when we look out and we see our enemies and they are hateful, and they are spiteful, and they are using us and abusing us, and they mock us, and they decry all sorts of ill about us. We need to remember we also were once like that. When I read Titus here, it puts it into a perspective like no other, because those those individuals that now hate us, that now hate me, at one time, I used to hate them. At one time, we were all foolish, disobedient, deserved, uh, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, wanting to do things our way. But unfortunately, the way of man is not the way of God. And it's the way that leads to destruction. So we need to stop doing the things that we think are right. And we need to start doing what God knows is right. If you have a need to respond to the invitation this evening, please come while we stand and while we sing. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, 
From the waters lifted me, now say, am I? Love lifted me, and love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, and love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. And love lifted me, and love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, and love lifted me. completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He your Savior wants to be, be saved today. And love lifted me, and love lifted me. When nothing else could help, Love lifted me, and love lifted me, and love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Is there anyone this evening who has not had opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper? If you would, just raise your hand. Okay, we have one in the back. Anybody else? You can stay where you are. That's fine. And we have Brother Joe over here. Oh, they're passing around. Certainly is a privilege for us to be here this evening, and uh, we know that perhaps some have not had opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper earlier today, but we make that available. We have a couple of people here in the auditorium to do so, and that's wonderful because they have chosen to remember their Lord. Of course, Jesus said, and it's right here on the front of this table, uh, this do in remembrance of me, and this is a memorial that uh, we remember that fateful day when Jesus took our sins to the cross and died the death that all of us should have died because of our own sins. And for that, we eat of the bread and partake of the fruit of the vine. Would you bow with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so blessed that we can be here. Everywhere we look, we see blessing even the world that has been tainted with sin. And we're so thankful for your love for us. Even looking out for our best interests, would we have failed to do so ourselves? We're so thankful for your son who came to the sinful world to offer himself up as a sacrifice for us, to offer up his body. We pray, dear God, that those who now partake of this, the bread, that they may do so that is well-pleasing in your sight. We therefore bless the bread. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you bow with me for the uh, fruit of the vine? 
Dear Heavenly Father, again we come before your throne of grace, acknowledging our sin and also acknowledging that we have come together to commune with you and with one another. We're so thankful for the blood that was shed on Calvary for our sins. We pray that you'd be with those once again that have chosen to remember the blood that was sacrificed for us all at this time. We bless the cup in Jesus' name. Amen. We uh, certainly do thank uh, Brother Chambers for our lesson this evening. Uh, I always appreciate when the preacher has a particular text in mind. And uh, tonight was Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 through 44. 48. I noticed that he expounded upon that in the same way that other New Testament writers did so, loving our enemies. Uh, you never can go wrong with that approach in Scripture. And he reminded us of some things that we need to be reminded about. It's very easy for us to be bitter, it's very easy for us to be disappointed and take it out on others by way of hatred. But that is something that should never be in the Christian's vocabulary and certainly not in the Christian's heart. And so we are so thankful for that. I had a opportunity while I was preaching to see who else had joined us on Zoom. Um, besides people in this auditorium, uh, we had 15 others, in other words, 15 other sites that were here. And we are blessed with uh, uh, a group here this evening, uh, some actually from the uh, Des Plaines congregation. Uh, we have Doris Ellison sitting right next to her daughter, uh, Jen, uh, who used to be Ellison, now is Bergstrom. And next to her, I think who brought brought her was uh, Ruth Lewis. She was with us this morning. And uh, we also have a longtime friend, Emmeline Howard. Always good to see you women. And we are joined by uh, Brother Joe Butterworth. Good to see you too, brother, this evening. So it's, it's good for us to be here this evening. I saw also some on Zoom that perhaps didn't make it this morning because of the time change. Uh, but they're on with us tonight. And uh, we are also help, uh, happy to see them. And yes, uh, Sister Ellison, Brother Don is, has joined us this evening as well. So I saw him on, on that as well. So what announcements do we need to make before we're dismissed this evening? How blessed we are to be here. And it's turning cold, isn't it? And we're supposed to be kind of nasty tomorrow, but we're headed towards spring. So uh, we'll be fine. Uh, Brother Ames has a closing prayer, and we announced this morning that both he and Sister Evelyn have placed membership with this congregation. Uh, they certainly are not strangers to us. Uh, he has preached for us several times and, and taught some. Uh, very knowledgeable, and we feel very blessed to have this couple with the congregation here. So I'm going to ask you to uh, stand, and uh, Brother Ames, you can unmute yourself, and would you please lead us in our dismissal prayer? I wasn't. Oh, he's not on? Oh, I thought he wasn't. Okay. He's not on. I just wanted to say, um, you know, it is wonderful to have the, the Ames um, joining, you know, joining us, placing membership. You know, and it's kind of something easy to forget and overlook as you may be with a congregation for a long, long time, but never placing membership. You know, it gets a little difficult, especially for the elders when we're not quite sure do we include that person on the notifications to people or yeah are they members of the flock that because we want to be able to shepherd and guard guide and protect and take care of 
So it really helps when they do so. So very grateful that they did place membership. Um, shall we go ahead and bow our heads? Our God in heaven, our wonderful heavenly Father, dear Lord, the one who loved us first, we say holy, 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 heavenly Father, when we look to you and we read your word, dear Lord, that word that gives us a very simple and powerful directive to love, to love one another, even our enemies. And what a specifically uh, powerful message that we hear tonight in the times that we're living in and the difficulties where it, there's so much anger and, and hatred and it's, it's tearing us apart, even members of the church. So dear Lord, we pray so fervently that you help us, Heavenly Father, that you help us guide our, guard our hearts, always looking up to you, dear Lord, for that example. For the example that we see in Christ Jesus walking this earth, showing us how we ought to live, for giving us an example of the, the love that we are to have for one another. Heavenly Father, you are so good, so gracious, long-suffering and kind. Help us, Heavenly Father, grow to that same end, dear Lord, to have the kind of patience that your Son showed on this earth for even the apostles who found themselves arguing, bickering, and complaining when even in the midst of the Son of God. Dear Lord, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for this evening, again, for another opportunity to hear your word, for the brother in Christ, Bob Chambers, who brought us this message tonight. We thank you, dear Lord, for that spirit that dwells within us, that helps guide us, that we are not left orphaned to walk this world. And dear Lord, we thank you for your patience your love that brought us your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And it's in his name that we give these thanks. Amen. Uh, Bob Chambers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what was the title of your uh, sermon tonight? Love your enemies. <laughs>